Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. So welcome to the podcast, everybody. It's been a while and we had a break for a little while. We got it to, I think it was 25 episodes and then... I felt like it was taking over my life and I had to have a little break before we came back. <laughs> so season two and we've got Northern Neil, Neil McKenzie back from Uddersfield, lad. How are you? All right, I'm from nowhere near Huddersfield, but... <laughs> <laughs> Your accent says different. <laughs> mm, okay. <laughs> um, so welcome back to Neil. And uh, today we're going to be talking about FRTOL. For, so for those who don't already know, FRTOL is the Flight Radio Telephony Operator's Licence. Now, there are three uh, documents we're going to be talking about during this process, um, and there are links in the show notes to these documents. So, first one is CAP 413, which is the radio telephony guide. This is a guide to the correct phraseology for for pretty much any circumstance you're going to come across. Um, This is a must-read for anybody learning to fly. Okay, so get hold of this. There is a link in the show uh, notes. Um, there are some specific chapters which we'll detail later on, which will be more um, in line with what you'll do with your training. Next document is CAP 2325. This is the guidance document uh, that outlines what to expect in the test. And the last one is SRG 1171. This is the mandatory training items that need to be signed off prior to any FRTOL test. So the first thing really is, um, do you need an FRTOL license, Neil? Well, if you want to exercise the privileges of your brand new private pilot's license or a higher license, then you will Mm -hmm. definitely need a uh, a fertile license to be added on to your uh, PPL. Um, Strictly speaking, no, it's not required, but your life will be very, very limited, particularly in the UK, if you don't have one of these licenses attached to it. So it's often forgotten about to the latter stages of the PPL training. And then sometimes it comes yeah. as a surprise, I find, to some students that you actually need to have some formal training and also a practical RT test, radio telephony test, to be mm-hmm. issued this license. Okay. Um, I just found that more and more recently because the process has changed ever so slightly, uh, mainly to mandate some training, which I fully agree with. Hmm. Um, obviously implemented by the uh, Civil Aviation Authority that um, they... Uh, they state that uh, a number of airspace infringements or recent airspace infringements, they uh, seem to link it to um, the radio telephony that's used or lack mm-hmm. of confidence of. So yeah. they, back in probably around about March, April 2022, they came up with this uh, new guidance, which we'll talk about as well. Yeah. I mean, I've got to, got to admit, Eve, you know, there is a lot of bad radio telephony out there, you know, myself included in that, you know, there are even instructors, you know. I think there is a... A level of radio telephony you will get away with day to day, which is vastly different to the quality of radio telephony that's required at a test, um, hence the need for the training. But I think generally it's a good thing to be as accurate with your radio telephony as close to CAP 4 and 3 as you can be. Um, would you agree? Yeah, we, we don't want anybody not to enjoy their licence. So with the formal training and and uh, passing this fertile licence or fertile licence, uh, addition to your license then at least you'll have the confidence to maybe transit some controlled airspace or know what to expect in order to uh uh, to request a zone transit uh, which we'll talk about a bit later on Mm -hmm. otherwise your life's going to be very very restricted and you're not exercising the privileges of your ppl to the uh you know to the maximum opportunity yeah and it's, it's amazing, actually, if you look at uh, private pilots when they say, oh, where are you going today? And they go, no, I'm going here. And you, you look at the, the plan they've made and it's a, it's a zigzag because they don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> so it's, it's a good thing to have that confidence. So what are the, the prerequisites? We're going to go through uh, SRG 1171. I mean, there's lots of documents out there, but we chose three to sort of focus in on. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all guidance documents, these ones, Mm -hmm. apart from the SRG 1171. So the document people aren't necessarily familiar with is um, CAP 413 to a later stage in their training. And rightly so, because it's not a particularly good read. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a reference document, um, which covers not all eventualities or all situations, but will cover the vast majority Mm -hmm. for a visual flight rules 
pilot, such as a PPL pilot. Um, we'll talk about the chapters in a little bit. Uh, the other one was the guidance for the fertile practical test. So this is a document that's been around uh, probably just over a year now from about um, April, March 2022. So in that, it will cover what's required for your fertile application or your fertile uh, practical test. So if you have a look at that, there's some good information in that, what's required and uh, the mandatory training before you apply for the test. It's divided into roughly about six sections, I would say, and it covers everything from how you're going to operate your own radio equipment within your aircraft. So your instructor, this is where your instructor would come in, he would show you this and uh, cover all the tick boxes and sign you off for that. So if your instructor does nothing more than that, um, he's at least introduced you to the form and been able to show you the equipment. So section one, aircraft radio equipment. So it's, uh, it's literally just turning it on. You might have an audio selector panel, which if you've been used to jumping in the aircraft with this already set up, which mm. tends to happen where there's an avionics buzz bar, mm. and you just flip, flip the one switch, and it's often all left with the same settings, which you find at quite a lot of flying training organizations or flying schools. Not much more thought is given to that. Yeah. So when somebody starts switching some of these items off, it yeah. can, uh, and you've only got you know, 20 hours behind you, 40 hours behind you, it can be a little bit more confusing. So it just helps that someone's shown you that, ticked it off, and then you've got section one complete. And this could be as simple as the intercom as well, mm -hmm. which I've found before um, is often hidden in various parts of the cockpit, depending on which aircraft you're flying. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you're wondering why you can't talk to the, to the guy yeah, next yeah. to you. So simple things like that. It sounds probably simple to a lot of people who might have, might have been flying for quite a while, but being new to the aircraft or new to flight training, um, these things will still be quite foreign to you. Well, it, that happened to me yesterday in that 152. Because it is the well, one as, from as owner of the aircraft. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's somebody else's aircraft. Well, that's um, it. All aircraft are different. Um, yeah, so yeah, sometimes so the, uh, I mean, there is obviously a standard format to how the aircraft should be laid out. But yeah, yeah. every so often, when uh, something's retrofitted, it's not necessarily in the uh, particular so place. That, that's just had to a see tiny it. little toggle switch that was on the other side, and I'm hunting around for it. There's got to be a switch somewhere, and it's there yeah, it is. And they're badly labelled and things as well sometimes. But yeah, so next section was section two: general phraseology. So this uh, more or less marries up with the uh, chapter of 413. So this is um, standard phrases. So something we do at the flying school we're at now for a trial flight, we try and introduce at least uh, one RT transmission mm -hmm. to the person carrying out the trial flight. And that's usually something like ready for departure. So that's a standard phrase recognized by... Uh, most other pilots and also by the uh, the operator you might be calling to, such as an air ground unit, a FISO unit, or even mm. an air traffic control unit. So it's relevant to all three main radio operators that you might be talking to. Um, I mean, that's for training and that's for, uh, you know, for probably another podcast and what exactly that means. But that's just to prevent you um, yeah. saying the uh, the precious words taking off or yes. played for takeoff, which yeah. shouldn't be ambiguous in any way whatsoever with somebody who's actually taking off on the yeah. runway. So there's other good phrases in there that just helps make things more succinct to the point and cuts down on long-winded sentences on the radio. Mm -hmm. So words like, I don't know, confirm, correction, mm -hmm. read back, things like these are all... Yeah. You'll, you'll find that in chapter... Uh, either chapter 2 or 3 in CAP 413, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about a bit more as well. Okay, so section 3... This will be departure procedures. Again, this will be relevant to the airfield you're at. More and more now, most flight training takes part from an air ground unit or an air ground communication service unit. So the vast majority of our pilots would be quite alien uh, yeah. to operate from, say, a larger airport, which may have air traffic control. Mm -hmm. And not only air traffic control, but several different units of air traffic yeah. control operating ground, the tower mm -hmm. and the radar after you depart the runway. So that's what I found recently people coming to test find most difficult is those sorts of units an air traffic yeah. control unit here at coventry it's a bit i want to say it's unusual around the midlands but there's lots of fiso mm. uh, flight information service officers that operate at airfields and that's kind of a, a mixed match of both air ground yes. and air traffic control yeah. where you've got instructions on the ground and you've got uh, information provided in the air or advisory um, notifications in the air and then there's air ground, which at the other airfield this flying school operates yeah. at, uh, there's an air ground, which is operated to various standards. Obviously, yeah. the person at the other side operating the air ground 
unit must have a, a certificate of competency themselves, but it's not necessarily from experience operating mm. to the guidance in CAP 413. So depending on the person's background experience before they come to test, some of the standard phraseology in that can still be a bit of a surprise. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, telephony that you can absorb, you know, from other people, you know, just listening to what goes on in the radio. Before you know it, you're saying things that aren't technically correct because you've heard it so many times. Yes, that's the other thing. There's um, good you can learn from other people and there's also bad habits you can learn from other people. Mm -hmm. If there's any doubt, then obviously um, go through it with an instructor and if you're not sure or not confident what's being told to you, the instructor will always point to the manual it's coming from. So that's where mm -hmm. you should be uh, you should be guided to if there's any uncertainty over mm -hmm. any of the phrases. So that's, that's departures. Um, very much the same for section four, which is the rivals, the inverse, mm -hmm. where you're coming to join um, an airfield. And usually the standard phrases are the same, such yeah. as... At, a, at an air traffic control airfield, you request join. At a FISO airfield, the same phrase, request join. Mm -hmm. Air ground, request join. It's what you get back that will yeah. be very different. Yeah. So one of them will be instructions, one of them will be advice, and one of them will just simply be uh, information. I think one of the key differences as well, like you said earlier on, if you're arriving at a controlled airfield, you'll generally be talking to a radar or approach service first, and then they might ask you to switch frequencies. Um, also, you may have um, gone onto an ATIS first before you call them up to get the information prior to making the call. So that makes it a little bit more complicated. Exactly. And if you've trained at one of these air traffic control airfields, you're used to all that, yeah. and you're used to pretty much to a degree being told what to do. Mm -hmm. And then the shock happens when you go to an air ground unit or even an airfield without any um, radio operation it's a bit of a shock that this is all on me what do I do now yeah it's up to you to initiate keep your eyes open and uh, look after yourself we we had all of that at one stage here at Coventry they closed the radar and air traffic service and then it went to air ground for a bit so you've gone from complete control to pretty much the wild west out there yeah, yeah. and then it went to FISO and it's, it's actually really really good here at the minute the, the team are very very good so, section five. Uh, five is the the main bread and butter of our VFR mm. uh, pilots flying en route somewhere. So, it's the en route section. So, this could include, and you'll most likely get this in an RT practical test, is your MATS penetration. So, that's flying mm -hmm. through a uh, military air traffic zone. Mm -hmm. And also a zone transit, which um, for the amount of Class D airspace mm -hmm. around most major airfields around the UK and how busy the UK airspace is at lower level, this is uh, certainly something you'll be using. So it's just covering those calls there, along with other items in the syllabus, such as maybe crossing danger, danger areas, uh, position reports, and there is some instruction on transponder mandatory zones and uh, some other items as well. Hmm. Section six is emergency and abnormal and loss yep. procedures, all items that you're guaranteed to yep. get in your test. So this is very important that these items are done to a uh, high degree of competency yeah. for when you're out there. Yeah. Um, this saves on time confusion when it's time critical in an yeah. emergency that the ATC unit or the unit you're talking to yeah. um, needs to react accordingly. And you're very limited on time when you're aviating, navigating and communicating mm -hmm. that you want to get the information across first time. So this is one item that is looked at um, very much uh, verbatim to a degree in this section. So that document then is the prerequisite, basically, for the test, or one of the prerequisites, isn't it? So they must have done the um, communications written exam. Um, they've got to do that, you know, prove that they've done all that and have that signed off. Um, so who can um, sign that, that form? You can self-certify if you wish. I don't know many people that have done that. I think you'd have to be very confident to uh, to have done that. Just prove you've been through the syllabus, which will guide you through CAT 413 to the relevant parts. Or what most people do is they get an instructor to sign it for them. So they'll yeah. get some formal training from their flying club uh, training organisation and uh, have the signature of an instructor. Okay. Now, we're talking about levels of preparation for these tests because... I think since all this stuff came in, it's been it's been recognised that the level of RT is is pretty poor, and and students' general attitude towards wanting to train on the radio is they seem very reluctant. 
And I think that's possibly because in their mind they've been using the radio all this time. It's kind of a, a formality, this test in their, their mind. In actual fact, this is this is really, really important to get this bit right. And, and yeah. you know, we're kind of suggesting that they do it a little bit earlier than what they um, have been doing in the past. Well, I think the job today is to make students aware of these three documents Mm. because just being aware of them will bring it into your mindset a little bit earlier than Mm -hmm. the week before your uh, skills test which seems to be happening at the moment we all do that it happens quite often at whatever flying training organization you're at you know we get that far and the instructor's priority will always be aviate navigate communicate and you are working under the uh, the guise of their um, own fertile license yes at that stage yeah and you can do it all the way up until test, but thereafter, if you want to go flying by yourself and enjoy the uh, privileges of mm. a pilot's license, then you will most likely or most definitely need yeah, this fertile. Absolutely. So in terms of level of prepare, you know, preparation for the test, we discussed this at length and we said the first thing is make sure you've read and understood CAP 413 sections relating to GA. Um, especially sections relating to air ground service, FISO service, ATC service and ATIS, Um, emergencies, so pan pan, mayday, mayday relay if you're relaying a message for somebody else, Uh, controlled airspace zone transit, match penetration, uh, loss procedures, radio failure procedures and services available outside of controlled airspace. And you can find these chapters in in, in CAP 413 so these are the, the chapters you really need to be focusing in on. So we've got chapter two and three, which is general phraseology. We've got chapter four, which is aerodrome phraseology. Chapter five, ATS surveillance services, so radar services. Uh, chapter six, approach uh, phraseology. Chapter eight, distress and urgency calls and loss calls. And then chapter 11 uh, is phraseology examples. And I think they were the key areas really, weren't they? That we, um, yeah, I mean, they're all key stuff, key items, but the two that are worth maybe honing in on or reading fully is probably Chapter 8 and Chapter 11. Mm-hmm. Don't forget, it's a document that covers everything from uh, helicopters to uh, vehicles operating on aerodromes mm. and lots of other scenarios, but the two that are most, well, can be fully read and directly relevant to the test and to everyday uh, flying operation would be Chapter 8. Um, lots of good examples in there of the loss procedure, direction finding, and also uh, mayday urgency calls, pan calls, etc. Yeah. in there. And chapter 11, there's some good examples of a mass penetration call and departure and arrival from different types of airfields there as well. Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the, distress, the distress calls, um, there's actually quite a lot of information to pass in a certain order, isn't there? So it's, um, it is quite good to, to make sure you're proficient at those. Um, so how do you find a fertile examiner well if your local club doesn't have any resident there then you can go to the uh, another cap document cap 1585e where the latest list of all the uh, up-to-date and uh, regulated examiners are for i mean there's 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 quite a lot all all across the country and their uh, details are on there for a direct contact but your club will most likely have at least a contact for one or two in your local area. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's CAP 1585E. I'll put the link in the show notes. So next thing is, um, how is the test conducted? So again, CAP 2325 for this one. Do you want to just go through that document with the, the listeners, Neil, and we'll talk about how it's conducted? Yeah, let's, let's give it its full name. It's Guidance for Fertile Practical Test for mm-hmm. Candidates, basically. To simply lay it out, you'll come with your prerequisites to say you're eligible to sit the test which is obviously um, your ID Mm -hmm. your uh, proof of your written communications exam and in date yeah and um, the uh, SRG 1171 that 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 famous number that we keep uh, referring to Mm -hmm. so that must have been all completed and signed and if you have done a test before then there'll be another form as well the 2190 that's just um, uh, a notice of failure to say you're not going to yeah. complete the same test again from the same examiner that's that's the idea behind that uh, once that's done without all the other sort of formalities with testing you'll get about five minutes to plot the route which is provided by the examiner usually based on the half mil uk cea chart so if you're not familiar with those 
it might be just worth a, a quick look before you get once you recognize what an airfield and mats uh, mm. looks like because i know some schools some students will work off quarter mil charts mm. so it's a half mil chart could be any of the three um around the uh, uk um sort of southern um middle england, middle england and then the, the one that contains scotland as well mm -hmm. so any of those and then you get five minutes to plot a route on that from the route given to you and the plan given to you. And then you'll also be given 20 minutes to plan any articles, which will, which you can use an aid memoir through the test. That's provided mm. to you. And it's also in that guidance document that we talked about in there. So if you want to see what that looks like and what the format or structure for an on-route call might look like, that's all in there. And that's all we're looking for, just mm. a standard structure with these calls. So that's in there. If you follow that pretty much as verbatim as you can then you're in good shape uh, for the uh, rt practical test and it's interesting because some of the phraseology has changed slightly recently hasn't it because like the on route stuff uh, which which ones is, in it, the, the, is it car pace that has changed oh there's various um, acronyms or mnemonics uh, but i think the one you're referring to is actually in the um the guidance uh, material yeah which is well yeah in it's based around uh, the word yeah. carper, so you know mm -hmm. your call sign, your aircraft type, your route, mm -hmm. your position and altitude, mm -hmm. and usually any other intentions or information at the end of that call as well, such mm -hmm. as I don't know VFR tracking via such and such VRP to another VRP, something along those lines. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So during the test, what what can they expect? So equipment wise, what we're going to be using that sort of thing? Well walkie talkies effectively not mm -hmm. uh, dissimilar to the way we're communicating now so some formal radio equipment it'll be operated in two separate rooms where the uh, fertile examiner will play the role of air traffic control FISO, air ground and uh, any other air vehicle or aircraft that might be relevant or out there mm -hmm. um, as you would in the real world and you will simply play yourself mm -hmm. so it will most likely if you're from a club such as this, because don't forget the test can be uh, used for uh, balloon operating pilots, helicopters, gliders, etc., etc., mm -hmm. um, or most air vehicles. And for us, the vast majority that come through our door are single engine piston pilots or want to be mm. single engine piston pilots, in which case you're most likely allowed to use the call sign you're used to, which helps, and your aircraft type as well will be agreed before the start of the test. Is it? It's not mandated glider pilots do it, is it? They don't have to have radio equipment. But I did hear some yesterday um, transmitting, which is is nice because you don't hear that so often. It's, uh, yes, I, it's, I mean uh, at low level, they tend to be uh, in yeah. the same area around the country, depending on where your your flying school is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so after the test is completed, then you'll find out immediately if you've passed or failed. So as the second part of the test is, once you've completed the route and you've successfully landed at your, uh, your destination, there'll be a question and answer session for another section of the test. Mm -hmm. So that's a mandatory part of the test that's pass-fail as well. Mm -hmm. It could be anything regards clarifying something on the test, or it could be some new questions, or maybe a part that wasn't covered mm -hmm. in the uh, requirements for the test. Um, at that stage, after that, you'll know the pass-fail results. For those who pass, you'll get a five-minute hot topic presentation, mm -hmm. which at the moment, surprise, surprise, um, is based around airspace infringement, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So we, we sat down and we tried to create some tips, didn't we? Um, you could offer somebody who's about to do their fertile. And we came up with, so be aware of CAP 413 sections recommended earlier. So th those list of chapters that we spoke about earlier. Do some practical revision sessions with a flight instructor prior to the test so that you can definitely demonstrate that you've got that knowledge in the SRG 1171. Um, what else do we put there? I've got to edit this bit. <laughs> well, the, the, main, the main thing we I think we wanted people to be aware is just be aware of these documents and mm. some preparation is required. Yeah. Ideally, some formal training. The ones that have struggled... Um, or not being successful have just turned up for tests literally yeah and then often been surprised that they are they need a uh, that form or those forms we talked about before commencing yeah. with the test so in in terms of making mistakes on the test as well we all make mistakes day to day on our radio so i think using phrases like disregard or correction 
um, is you know is acceptable in everyday radio. It's acceptable in the test. Yeah, right? with, yeah. I mean, uh, I think what you're referring to, if it's something within the same transmission, yeah, common items might be a, a mistake with times. That's quite a quite a usual one. So yeah. if you're estimating arrival somewhere at one four one two and it's wrong, you'll say estimating arrival one four one two correction one four one zero. It's something along those lines, basically. Yeah. But that'll make sense from ideally experience. You may have heard it already mm-hmm. or just reading about it in Cat 4 and 3. You can see where it's relevant, yeah. uh, where its use is relevant in what particular phrases or transmissions. So next thing is, obviously, we don't want to wish anyone a bad luck in their test at all. But if they were unsuccessful, um, what is the process then? Well, three attempts is generally um it'd be unusual for it to go beyond three attempts but the general format is the forms we talked about you turn up for your initial test or your first test ideally that's when we'd want to pass on the first test with all the documents we mentioned mm-hmm. if unfortunately you're unsuccessful you'll be recommended to come back for another test um, there's no mandatory re- training necessarily required for a second test mm-hmm. you can come back to the same organization or same examiner you don't have to, you can pick another one, mm-hmm. but obviously you'll turn up with your SRG 2190 uh, form yeah. um, stating that you can't do the same route that you've just done, so the new examiner will pick another route. Mm-hmm. After the second uh, test, if you're unsuccessful, then it'll be mandated further training is required, and at which stage you'll be, uh, um, you would carry that out with a senior fertile examiner at okay. that stage, so they would make the uh, the decision what happens beyond that. But would, you obviously wouldn't want to get to that stage and there's something falling down in the process if unfortunately you have found yourself to that stage. Either somebody is not keeping their end of the bargain, yeah. either the person um, carrying out the training uh, or where your or, or your process with the training is, is, is falling down mm-hmm. or perhaps maybe you're not as prepared as you should be mm. for those tests. Okay. So don't forget, if you do need any help with your radio telephony preparation, we can help you here at Alma if you're local to us. So if you want to do some on Zoom with us, and we do carry out the fertile uh, examinations here as well. So we hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you, Neil, for coming on on the podcast again. Um, uh, Hopefully you found it valuable. Um, Anyone listening to it who's looking to do their fertile test at the moment, and please do like, subscribe, and ding the bell for notifications of the next episode. Thank you. Now, if you can hear the difference, if you put it quite close to your mouth, you'll hear the difference in your mic straight up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Late night love for Neil. <laughs> Hard <laughs> FM. <laughs> oh, God. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.